Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for American Progress. If you could all please take your seats. Our program will begin shortly. Two brief reminders before we begin. First, please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. Second, there will be a question and answer following the panel discussion. We ask that you wait for the microphone to come to you. State your name and affiliation before your question. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Center for American Progress Action Fund. My name is Neera Tandon, and I'm president here at CAP Action. I want to thank you all for joining us for this incredibly timely and critical discussion about Puerto Rico's future. Puerto Rico is facing the worst financial and human humanitarian crisis in its history. On July 1st, the Puerto Rico government is set to default on nearly $2 billion in debt payment and the island has already been forced to close more than 100 schools, lay off staff at hospitals, and dramatically reduce funding for vital, vital government services. Without immediate action, the situation will only grow worse. Recently, the government has even confirmed cases of the Zika virus in Puerto Rico, and I have to say, now is clearly not the time to be cutting funding for critical health and emergency services in the area. We here at the Center for American Progress and CAP Action believe that Congress must act swiftly to provide real support to the people of Puerto Rico. And the House has already passed bipartisan legislation to help Puerto Rico avoid, avoid the devastating impacts of the impending default. So while well, you know, some have raised questions about, uh, about it, the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, or PROMISA, contains critically important tools and protections that would provide immediate relief for Puerto Rico, and it is vital that it passes. The Senate is expected to consider PROMISA next week with mere days to spare before the July 1st deadline. CAP fully supports these relief efforts and urges the Senate to pass PROMISA without fur further delay. 
But our work must not end there. The Puerto Rican economy still faces significant challenges before beyond July 1st. And I have to say that we should go beyond this crisis to recognize that we all have a road to play in Puerto Rico rebuilding. This morning, we're lucky to host Gover the governor of Puerto Rico, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, who has continued to advocate tirelessly for the interests of Puerto Rican families and demand urgent action from Congress. We're really honored to have him. Joining Ger Governor Garcia Padilla on the panel will be Puerto Rico's resident commissioner and only member of Congress, Pedro Pierluisi, Counselor to the U.S. Treasury Secretary Antonio Weiss, and Professor Simon Johnson, who teaches entrepreneurship at MIT's Sloan School of Management and is a great voice on social media. Uh, the conversation will be led by CAP Actions Vice President for Economic Policy, Mark Jersulik. And without further ado, I'd like to bring our distinguished panel up to, up to discuss. Hello. Hey, as, uh, <clears throat> as near as indicated, uh, there's a, an intense fiscal, financial, and humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico. That crisis itself is complex, and the PROMESA bill, which is uh, the, uh, the piece of legislation which the House has passed uh, to try to deal with these uh, problems, is itself complex. Uh, not easy to understand, and we're very fortunate here to, to have four people who are eminently qualified to help us understand both the fiscal and financial problems of Puerto Rico and the solutions that are being uh, offered. And from on my right here is uh, Governor Alejandro uh, Garcia Padilla, uh, Representative um, Pedro P uh, Perluisi, Counselor uh, Antonio Weiss, and Professor um, Simon Johnson. Um, and so I'm gonna begin with questions for uh, the panelists, do some follow-ups, um, and then at the end of our discussion, uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, so let's dive right in, and I'd like to begin with the governor. Uh, governor, could you please tell us uh, what the effects would be if absent PROMESA July 1st uh, rolls around and Puerto Rico is forced to default on the $2 billion in debt payments which are due on that date? Well, first of all, uh, I, I, two step uh, uh, before. I need to, to address the issue that, that uh, defaulting is not an option. Uh, uh, it's, it's just a reality. We do not have the money. It's, 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 I cannot opt or refuse to uh, pay. It's an issue that the money is not there. So, so that's why we have been saying that we will default on July 1st. It's, uh, I, cannot, I cannot tomorrow wake up in the morning and say, you know, I will pay because then uh, uh, the Government Development Bank and the, the, my chief of staff will say, you, you may have the will to pay, but you don't have the money to pay. So what will be the, the what will happen uh, is something that already began. Uh, two days ago, we were sued in the Southern District of Euro Federal Court uh, uh, in New York, uh, and Puerto Rico is uncovered. We, we, we are at mercy of the judge. And that already happened in the Federal District Court of Puerto Rico, and they are asking for uh, temporary relief uh, 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 and, and for embargoes on our, on our, on our accounts, on Puerto Rico uh, Treasury accounts. So what will happen if uh, we will be at that mercy, if, and if those uh, temporary relief are granted by the court, we will not be able to provide uh, essential services. And, and if you see the complaint, is is I think uh, reveal a lot the, the complaint that our creditors are asking the court and are, are they are, are arguing to the court that the govern the governor of Puerto Rico is threatening them saying that he will pay essential services prior to pay them hell yes. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but that's 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 their argument, and 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 they are they are asking the court to stop me to provide essential services um, uh, in place of uh, uh, paying them. So what will be the consequences that I will not be able to provide essential services? That means something as simple as fuel for the patrol, pa patrol cars and fire trucks. Or, or to pay the, the uh, edu special education therapies for our kids, um, or, 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 or to provide to the contractor that empties septic tanks in schools that have to do with Zika, um, um, to, pay, to be able to, to keep open and operating our main medical center. So when we're talking about essential services, we're talking about the very essential services. So, uh, yeah, there's, the, there's the real live possibility that the kind of legal action that'll be bought, brought by these creditors and, and others <clears throat> could do a lot to intensify the problems that have been brought on by austerity that's already underway in Puerto Rico. I, I think that it's already happening. I, it's it's th something that we w thought that will begin after July 1st already began two weeks ago. So, so right now, if, 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 the, if this judge grant, or he has to be asking to grant in the uh, Federal District Court for the Southern District of New York, we will be in deeper and bigger problems and troubles that we are right now. So, and so you'll literally be in the position of either paying with whatever cash you have for essential services or defying or, and defying a court or cutting back on those services. They say I will not be able to be in that position. I will be, it will be a judge who will decide that. Okay, um, not exactly a, a, a trivial problem. Um, Congressman Pierluisi, um, the, the PROMESA bill uh, has some provisions to deal with the issue of uh, default and restructuring, but it also has other, other conditions. Uh, there's a, uh, an oversight board and other things that are going to be required of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico uh, under this legislation. Could you give me your evaluation of how the entire legislation functions <coughs> and what its effects will be on Puerto Rico? Yeah, it's a, it's a broad question and, and, the, and the broad background is that Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rico's economy hasn't been growing now for over 10 years and Puerto Rico has been losing population at, unprecedented, at, a, at an unprecedented level during that same decade. You're talking about a reduction in population exceeding 10% uh, of our population in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, we need to revert that. We need to get Puerto Rico back on its feet, back on a path to growth, and we need to attract population, not lose population like we have, okay? So that's the big challenge now. First things come first. We will not be able to grow unless we have a functioning, fiscally healthy government. The government of Puerto Rico is about to collapse. It lost all access, adequate access to the financial markets a year and a half ago or more. It didn't even get for the last fiscal year and definitely will not get for this fiscal year transfinancing. That's tax and revenue anticipation notes. That's basically a line of credit to operate during the year. Why does the governor say that he cannot make those payments in July? Because July is the first month of the fiscal year and Puerto Rico has absolutely no access to the markets. So in addition, you have a government that owes over $2 billion to contractors and suppliers coming from the private sector. That's a government that is not helping growth. In addition, the government itself, because of this fiscal crisis, uh, has a, 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 is basically a, a, a huge counterparty risk for any private capital thinking about investing, for example, in the energy sector of Puerto Rico. We would love to have a private company come in, design, build, and operate an LNG plant in Puerto Rico so that we have lower cost of energy. But who's going to do that when you have a government about to collapse? That's the background. Now, what PROMESA does is assist Puerto Rico. What this legislation does is assist the government of Puerto Rico so that it can restore 
its financial fiscal health and it can gain back access adequate access to the markets to the financial markets it does so by providing Puerto Rico a broad debt restructuring mechanism advocated by the US Treasury Department and also creating a fiscal oversight board now a lot has been said about the board and uh, part of the opposition that this legislation is getting is based on misinformation, based on prior drafts of this legislation, based on uh, pure semantics. This board will oversee this broad restructuring mechanism that will give the government of Puerto Rico the ability to refinance, restructure its debts in a fair and orderly fashion. And the board will oversee this. The board will also ensure that Puerto Rico has a viable long-term fiscal plan and that it balances its budgets on a yearly basis as, by the way, our constitution in Puerto Rico so requires. Now, why is the board doing that? Because we will be restructuring the public debt of Puerto Rico but we want to make sure that we don't end up in the same place four or five years down the road. We also want to make sure that Puerto Rico gains back access to the markets and the way to gain back access to the markets is by having credibility, by having balanced budgets. Because when you look at the total debt of Puerto Rico, my under the uh, sleeve calculation is that one third of this $70 billion debt we have in Puerto Rico is basically, basically deficit financings. It's, it's basically going to the markets for, to finance operating expenses of the government and its instrumentalities. That's not good debt. And so we need to fix this. Fix it in the short run through debt relief and in the long run through fiscal responsibility at the government of Puerto Rico level. That's what PROMESA does. PROMESA doesn't do lots of things that Congress should also do. Correct disparities in federal programs. The U.S. Treasury was advocating for parity or enhanced funding to Puerto Rico under the Medicaid program. PROMESA doesn't give Puerto Rico access to tax credit programs, the Earned Income Tax Credit Program, the Child Tax Credit Program. U.S. Treasury was advocating for that. I would love the Congress to do that. I have bills proposing that. PROMESA doesn't do that. There hasn't been will on the Republican side of the aisle to make any kind of significant spending in the, in the context of this crisis. But PROMESA at least deals with the immediate crisis that the governor is talking about and sets up a board that will assist Puerto Rico to get back on its feet uh, on a fiscal basis. Uh, maybe we could follow up just a little bit about the on the relationship between the oversight board and the Puerto Rican government. I mean, uh, clearly that board is going to have some power. What implications does this have for the kind of self-regulation of the Puerto Rican government and economy in the longer term? Okay. Uh, prior versions of this legislation had a board that was micromanaging the government of Puerto Rico treating Puerto Rico like the District of Colombia when you shouldn't, because Puerto Rico is a lot larger. It has a constitutional form of government. It has a three-branch government. Puerto Rico is not subject to the, the budgets of the government of Puerto Rico have never been reviewed by Congress on a yearly basis, and its laws have never been uh, reviewed or even revoked by Congress. Um, that's not the way it has worked in the past. Now, what the bill does now it basically allows the governor to come up with a fiscal plan and the board will review it. And if the board agrees that the plan is viable, it's reasonable, it'll, get, it'll, it'll give the fiscal plan its blessing. The law itself lays out the factors that need to be taken into account when developing this plan. And it says, among other things, that it has to provide adequate funding so that the government can give essential services. It also says that the plan must identify adequate funding for the pension systems to meet their obligations, among other, other factors. It also promotes you know, accurate 
forecasting of expenses and revenues. So all of that is incorporated in this bill and the board will be overseeing that and the board will also approve budgets on a yearly basis, but the governor and the legislature will be the ones coming up with the budgets subject to the board's review. The budgets must be in co consistent with the fiscal plan. Mm -hmm. Finally, the board will be monitoring spending so that it falls in line with the approved budgets. And you shouldn't blame the board for doing that because again, Puerto Rico will be getting debt relief, substantial debt relief as a result of this le legislation and needs access to the markets. And that's a way for gaining access to the markets. Having a board overseeing the government along these lines that I'm talking about, not more, and within four or five years, that, that should be the goal, the board will cease to exist. Puerto Rico will have access to the markets. The government will be helping Puerto Rico to grow as opposed to impeding the growth. And that should be the overarching goal for all of us. Thank you. Uh, Antonio, uh, you've been working on this long and hard. You've been taking the lead for, uh, for the administration on getting a, a legislation through the Congress to aid Puerto Rico. Could you give us the administration's view on PROMESA, how it's evolved, and uh, what it implies for the long-term health of the Puerto Rican economy? Well, the, the, the president has strongly endorsed uh, PROMESA, and I'd like to make a comment sitting next to the governor and the congressman about bipartisanship. And I think what uh, citizens expect of government is that when 3.5 million Americans' safety and well-being are at risk, that government will set aside differences in order to design solutions. And most, but perhaps not all in this room, know that the governor and the congressman are from rival political parties in Puerto Rico and have been united from the very moment when we first brought to the Senate our four-pillar plan for Puerto Rico last October, it's exactly eight months ago. Second, the House has voted by an overwhelming majority, 297 votes, including a substantial majority of Republicans and of Democrats, 75% in favor in the Hispanic Caucus and 90% in favor in the Progressive Caucus for there to be a solution by July 1st. And the administration's position is that the essential tools that are provided by this legislation need to be in place by July 1st. And I, 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 will, I will just highlight, as the governor and the congressman have already said, it is already a, the case that our fellow citizens in Puerto Rico are at risk. One concrete example, uh, the secretary brought a group of people to Puerto Rico a few weeks ago, and the Centro Medico which is the most sophisticated hospital for certain services in San Juan and in Puerto Rico as a whole, can only obtain essential medical uh, needs and equipment on a cash-on-delivery basis. The neonatal unit of the Centro Medico can only obtain vital uh, vital needs and medical supplies, cash on delivery. So it is not just debt payments which are missed. It is also the tightening of credit, the absence of investment into the island. And so, you know, what does this bill do? The bill provides, number one, a stay on litigation. That stay goes into effect immediately upon the law's signature by the president. Second, that stay is retroactive to the very first lawsuits which were filed in connection with the debt in December of last year. The stay remains in effect until the debt has been restructured to a sustainable level. And what it assures is that Puerto Rico emerges in an orderly fashion from this crisis of debt with a sustainable amount of, a sustainable amount of uh, debt. Today, debt service consumes more than one-third of every revenue dollar that comes into Puerto Rico. There is no state or municipality in the United States where this is the case. It is five to six times the most levered state or municipality, or the, the median, and three times the most levered. We need to put this emergency legislation into place, and we need to pass it by July 1st. Well, Simon, let, let me turn to you. Uh, you were the chief economist at IMF 
2007-2008. You're familiar with what happens to sovereigns uh, who are experiencing the kind of fiscal and financial crisis that Puerto Rico is experiencing. What would you say that the effect on Puerto Rico would be if things were allowed to uh, unfold without passing PROMESA? What's, what are the likely implications for the Puerto Rican economy? Well, well, Mark, I think the governor already spoke to that quite, quite eloquently. You're on a, the downward part of a very deep and rapid uh, descent, a debt spiral. And, and of course, this is exacerbated by the point that, uh, that Antonio just made. These are American citizens. American citizens who have the right to live anywhere in the United States, they will leave. And, and I would say this to, to, to all the, the creditors um, in, in the room and, 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 and around the world who for whatever reason, believe this was a, a good investment. It, it seems to the rest of us like it was an incredibly risky investment. But the tax base of Puerto Rico is the people of Puerto Rico. It's the people who work there. It's the people who pay taxes there. They are going to move because the health care is collapsing, uh, because there will be no other essential services, because the schools will be dangerous places to send your children. And it's a very long list. So I don't understand why any creditor, let, let alone any citizen or resident of Puerto Rico, I don't understand why any creditor would oppose an orderly restructuring mechanism with appropriate governance, which is exactly what PROMESA has in place. Mark, we don't ever have this at the international level. This is why some of these international crises become so bad and so disastrous. There's an opportunity here for Puerto Rico and for the United States to do things in a better, more orderly fashion. It's not going to be easy for anyone. Let's not kid ourselves. But there is an opportunity here. But if it's not done by July 1st, I think the nightmare scenario is already upon us. And if, if we're looking at the scale and scope of what can happen in the negative direction if nothing's done, can you think of examples from, from other economies where uh, these kinds of steps weren't taken and the effects were allowed to uh, uh, unwind over a long period of time? Well, I don't like to, to name specific, specific countries in, in, in this kind of setting. Uh, and all of these comparisons are, are complex when you compare sure. them with sovereign, sovereign nations. But I, I think the evidence is overwhelming from experience we've had um, across countries and, and within countries that when you get into a downward debt spiral, when you can't maintain essential services, and then you put American-type lawsuits on top of that and the scramble to the courthouse and the scramble to seize assets or to put liens on, on accounts and prevent payments from being made, there's a, an awful lot of randomness that comes with federal judges making their decisions as they see best. This is going to compound many of the worst problems we have ever seen in any country facing serious debt problems, Mark. And, and I, I, I cannot emphasize how concerned I am for, for the health and well-being of, of the people living in Puerto Rico, the families, the children, the people needing medical attention. This is a dramatic and dangerous situation, which for, for, for once, through an amazing amount of effort uh, on the part of the, the, the gentleman sitting here and, and everyone working with them, um, there is an opportunity to turn a corner and, and, and to get an opportunity to make things better. <coughs> Uh, uh, if may, I may add, uh, what, uh, supporting what Dr. Johnson just pointed out, uh, what, what I think that uh, our creators should focus on is on make our economy growth. What happens? What, why will we get here? Well, in a very small nutshell, during the 70s, we, can, we got into a recession because of the oil crisis. Congress reacted and approved Section 936 of the Internal Revenue Code to uh, allow Puerto Rico to compete. We went out of recession. In 96, Congress repealed Section 936 with a 10 year phase out period that ends in 2006. What happened in 2006? We walk in again into a recession because our, uh, we lost more than 100,000 jobs during that, those 10 years. So our economy base, our, our, our tax base was reduced. From 2006 to, from, uh, to 2012, governors from both local parties and both parties here in the states too, fixed the gap, filled the gap with loans. And we doubled our debt. Our debt in, in December 2005 was $37 billion. When I was sworn in, the debt was $70 billion. <coughs> So from 37 to 70 in six years. Right now is around 68. What we should be working on, everybody, including creators, fixing our economy, 
making our uh, 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 people stay in Puerto Rico to produce more so we can add revenue, so we can pay. Uh, that's all about, uh, and uh, adding to what Pedro pointed out before, the bill is not perfect. I do not like the board. I do not like that it doesn't add uh, 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 mechanism to make our economic growth. But what's the alternative right now? So that's why I called the Senate to vote uh, in, uh, for, this, for, for this bill. I sent a letter to all 100 senators yesterday uh, asking them to, to approve the bill as it is. Because we need the bill by July 1st. Uh, it's, we need the bill yesterday. <laughs> T terrific. I, I, I think that we made a, a, you know, a very good case of the urgency of this bill and the, the kinds of relief that it will provide for Puerto Rico. Uh, there is you know, criticism and opposition to the bill, and I thought we might also spend a little bit of time addressing some of those criticisms. Um, for, for example, uh, the bill has some almost extraneous provisions on things like minimum wage and overtime. Um, which you know, could potentially uh, reverse uh, the kinds of, of labor market requirements that exist for other U.S. citizens and you know, reduce those protections in Puerto Rico. Uh, what do you th think about that? Uh, do you think it's likely that these kinds of provisions will have an effect under PROMESA? Let's say that, well, I will be, because we need to fix this, this together and to make this more suitable to happen. I decide not to run, uh, to be reelected, uh, and 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 since I have been able to make or be part, being part of a wider coalition of Puerto Ricans that from different parties, like Pedro and I, uh, locally we are both Democrats, but but locally we are from different parties, and we run in different ballots. Uh, uh, but but at, at the end of the day. As a governor, I will not opt in for that. So the bill allowed the governor to extend the period of time where, where a youth in Puerto Rico is not until 20, 20 or less uh, for 90 days and extend that uh, on, of 25 or less for five years. But the governor need to opt in to reduce the, um, the uh, uh, minimum wage. So I will not do it, and I bet that none of, uh, of, of those that are uh, uh, fighting to be my successor will opt in for that. Uh, uh, I think that that will not happen. Uh, but the bill includes that option for the governor. Yeah, let, me, let me add to that, and, but I agree with what the governor just said. Um, this language is unnecessary. You, know, you, you, called, you said it, it's extraneous. That's what it is. But it's there. Now, eh, the way it works is that Puerto Rico will not have a lower minimum wage. No, no candidate for governor supports that. No governor will opt in to extend uh, the time you can be paying younger workers uh, 425 an hour as opposed to 725 an hour to four years or so. And uh, the legislature of Puerto Rico also can increase the minimum wage for younger workers from 425 to 725. There's nothing impeding that from happening. So this is becoming like a messaging type provision, but it's, <coughs> it's meaningless. It's not going to happen. I know part of the opposition also has to do with pensions in Puerto Rico. And, and these are things that this, is, th this bill is the product of long-standing negotiations. This, is not, this didn't, didn't happen overnight. This was leadership. Uh, from both sides of the aisle, in the House, negotiating with, along with, the Treasury Department, White House officials. And it's not perfect, like the governor just said, but it's the product of a bipartisan deal. And uh, it is a compromise. Now, pensions. There's language in here saying that it, the fiscal plan of Puerto Rico should provide adequate funding for our pension systems. That was part of these negotiations. That was another issue that has been raised. On the Republican side of the aisle, and I'm not going to be fingering anybody, but a lot of the campaign against this legislation and my own Chapter 9 uh, bill in the past has been, this is a bailout. No such thing. This doesn't cost a penny to American taxpayers. 
no bailout whatsoever. Uh, and then this is not fair to creditors. Not true either. Finally, uh, one of the other issues that was raised is the fact that under Puerto Rico's constitution, general obligation bonds have top priority in terms of repayment. That's so now. What the bill says is that the fiscal plan should respect the relative priorities of all credit, uh, creditors in Puerto Rico under Puerto Rico law, including our constitution. So there's even language respecting the relative rights of creditors so that whenever we restructure Puerto Rico's debt, we do it in a fair and orderly fashion. We have been addressing in this bill all the different arguments that have been raised. Not perfect, but indispensable. Excellent. <clears throat> okay, um, if panelists have final comments they'd like to make about any of the issues we've raised, uh, then we could go to Q and A. Fine for me. Okay. If there if there are people who have questions, could you stand and identify yourselves, please? Someone will take the microphone. Hi. Thanks, uh, Jonathan Miller, CQ Roll Call. Um, had a question. Obviously, the Senate is going to uh, consider this bill next week. However, there is the chance that they do not um, come up with a solution by July 1st. Um, this is a question for Mr. Weiss. Is, I know that the, you have said in the past there is no plan B. At this point, do you envision a plan B? Can Treasury do anything absent action from Congress? Thanks. I encourage anyone who hasn't read it to look at Congresswoman Velasquez's statement. And in her statement of support, uh, she said she has been screaming for so long she has lost her voice and that no one should be hide behind alternatives that don't exist. We have an alternative. That alternative is not perfect. It does not include all of the administration's priorities as has been pointed out. But if anyone had any doubt about what would happen on July 1st, the lawsuit that was filed by hedge funds in New York last Tuesday puts those doubts uh, aside. And, and I read, it has long been settled law, the lawsuit contends, that constitutional debt is constitutionally required to be paid first in times of scarcity ahead of even what government deems essential services. So this is a product of compromise, and it contains elements which one or the other party would not support. But in its core tenets, a stay on litigation and a sound mechanism to restructure all of the Commonwealth's debts, this is a sound approach. And it gives the Commonwealth the tools it needs to get out of what is a crisis, as every panelist has said, that puts at stake the safety and well-being of the citizens in, in Puerto Rico. Back there. Thank you. Kasia Klimashinska from Bloomberg News. I have a question for the governor. Um, you said you have no money and you will def default on July 1st. If you could walk us through what exactly will happen, I mean, who will get paid? Will you know, schools or uh, uh, your state employees get paid? Will general obligation bondholders get paid? Will anyone get paid? Yeah, well, uh, we have, we have, we do not have the money to, to the payroll or to the medical center or to the healthcare system and to pay our debts. Uh, it's, it's around 800 million uh, just on GOs. Uh, so if, if we take money from the payroll and from the, we, we, will, we will need, if I take, if I shut down the government in July 1st, even though I will not have enough money to pay, just to put you into perspective, even though if I shut down the government, so that means all of the above of the examples that you mentioned, I will not have enough money to pay. 
that will be very bad for creditors too. Because, because then the economy will be, as Dr. Johnson pointed out, in a debt spiral and will go further below where it is not right now. So we will collect less on, in August. So then I will have less money to pay. Uh, uh, so I, from the creditors' perspective, they should be trying to find a way to Puerto Rico walk out of this not to uh, add obstacles in this, in this, in this uh, race. No, so I, so just, just all of the above. And I will not have enough money to pay if that happens. And I'd like to point out it's not just what happens in the central fund and the payment of services. It has to do with the extension of credit, which is already evaporating. It has to do with the terms of trade, which tighten. And it has to do ultimately with what Professor Johnson pointed out, which is the, the flight of young working families from Puerto Rico to the mainland where they enjoy safer conditions, better uh, Medicaid. And last year alone, just to put the figure out there, nearly 100,000 Puerto Ricans left this represents more than two and a half percent of the population. What this bill needs to do is lay a foundation such that families are not torn apart, that children under the age of five do not continue to be taken out by their families for better opportunity on the mainland. And ultimately, we need a foundation for growth so that the families that want to return to Puerto Rico can begin to do so. Otherwise, there is no long-term economic future for this, for, this, uh, for this commonwealth. Other questions? Uh, it's working now. Sofia Dalt, Embassy of Portugal, two questions, please. One regarding the, the composition of the Oversight Committee, which has also been uh, criticized in the media in the sense that it didn't have enough Puerto Ricans um, being part of it. So this is the first question. Second question, uh, regarding the stay on litigation, does it or does it not also provide for uh, Puerto Rican government to hold the payments of interest to the creditors? Meaning, has it has an immediate effect on also uh, suspending the obligation to pay interest regarding the debt? Thank you. I'll, I'll start with uh, addressing the, the board composition and then perhaps, uh, Antonio, you can deal with the stay and its uh, implications. Um, the board uh, consists of seven members appointed by the president, six of them coming from recommendations given by leaders, leaders in the House and the Senate from both sides of the aisle. Um, one of them um, is appointed by the president in his own discretion. Um, the, the bill requires that one of the two um, board members um, recommended by the Speaker of the House be a resident of Puerto Rico, but there's nothing in the bill prohibiting um, the leaders in the House and the Senate, as well as the President himself, from appointing people with connections with Puerto Rico, either born in Puerto Rico or with um, uh, a significant business presence in Puerto Rico. My own preference, and I think would be, and ho hopefully this will happen, that a, a, a sizable or a large number of the members of the board will have Puerto Rican connections, either born in Puerto Rico or, or a lot of exposure to Puerto Rico in the past. I urge uh, leaders in the House and the Senate to consider people from Puerto Rico for the board as well as the president. So we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, but uh, what I'm saying to you is that I tend to expect that, uh, again, three or four members of this board will have a, a connection with Puerto Rico, as, as they should. i just like to add that, that we, we are concerned we'll be in that board. We want, of course, I prefer Puerto Ricans, or people with connection with Puerto Rico, as Pedro pointed out, uh, but we need good people. 
we need to solve this. It it's cannot be now an issue of, uh, of, of uh, patriotism uh, uh, on who will be in the board. The main patriotic, patriotic issue that we should take care of in Puerto Rico, I'm talking about now patriotism from the Puerto Rican perspective, from our perspective, is to fix this problem. Uh, neither Pedro or I will be in the, in, in the government next year. What we want to do is to fix this. So the next governor and, and governors to come in the future and Puerto Ricans can stay there and, and, and have a better life there. So yes, we want Puerto Ricans, but good Puerto Ricans, uh, capable is what, is what I mean. People capable to do this. I, and there's American uh, people capable to do this. So what we need is good people, very good, the best of the best uh, dealing with with the, with, the, with the biggest debt crisis in the history of the United States. And something that I want to point out, we get here because of previous governments in Puerto Rico that were not responsible, but responsibility in, the, in Congress too. So, so yes, they need to act because they were part of the creation of the problem. Okay. Uh, no, I'd, I'd like to add, just on the board, uh, first of all, the qualifications of the board members are very clearly set forth in the statute. And that is that there should be substantial experience in government and business and municipal finance in the very elements the governor is describing. Second, their conflict of interest standard is extremely high. There's a federal conflict of interest standard that applies to any board member. And really the spirit of this board is that it should be representative of the people of Puerto Rico. The president has said uh, that he is open to a uh, Puerto Rican representative. Leader Pelosi has said the same. We expect, uh, as both the congressman and the governor have said, there will be substantial Puerto Rican representation on this board. And importantly, the board is designed to go away. So the board, unlike the control board, which had executive functionality in Washington, which this board does not have, this board goes away after four years of balanced budgets. In addition, it operates according to the statute, and the statute defines the elements of a fiscal plan. Pages 39 and 40 out of this 140-page bill set forth 14 criteria that this board must look to in certifying a fiscal plan. Some of these have been mentioned. The debt has to be sustainable. There has to be adequate fun uh, funding for pensions. Essential services must be paid. And so the board operates according to a very clearly defined statute. As to the stay, it would indeed free up essential breathing room for the economy such that the governor and his successors would not be forced to make the terrible decisions that he has described. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Nick Timmero, so the Wall Street Journal. Um, I, I guess I have two questions, maybe first for Mr. Weiss. Uh, you know, one of the big selling points on this bill um, on both sides, but especially with Republicans, has been that it doesn't spend any money. And I wonder how realistic is it that the control board will be able to do its job over the long run without having some additional commitment of uh, federal funding, um, such as for health care, as you mentioned, in the future? And the second question for the governor, uh, Tax revenues are up year over year, uh, mostly because of the sales tax increase. Given that, why would the government now have a uh, financing crunch if revenues are up uh, from where they were 12 months ago? I'm very tempted to answer your second question, but I really shouldn't with the executive to my left. You, 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 but you do know that there have been no set-aside payments made for this GO payment. Uh, in other words, this will be the first time there have been no set-asides made. And, and the accounts are transparent, but I'll let the, the governor come on to, come on to that. Uh, you know, as to um, the, uh, the first question, th no, it's, it's very clear that this is a necessary step to avert a fiscal, liquidity, and humanitarian crisis, and it needs to be law by July 1st. We've been very clear about that. We have not said it is sufficient. It is not sufficient. 
and we all have a role to play in making sure that Puerto Rico has the tools it needs over the long run to achieve economic growth. And you know, the administration called for health care parity. It called for an earned income tax credit. Equally, there are things that can be done in the Commonwealth uh, to encourage growth, and the private sector has a role to play. But without this bill, quite, quite clearly what happens is there is no foundation to build upon. So we are safeguarding the economy. We are safeguarding the people of Puerto Rico, our fellow citizens. But as the bill makes clear, there is an eight-person commission to study additional means of economic growth. That committee will come back uh, uh, with recommendations, and we, we shall see what they are. But our immediate concern is to, is to pass this bill. Well, uh I think both questions are, really, are related, that both answers are, are related. Uh, the, the, the bill is not uh, self-sufficient to uh, fix the whole problem. We need to uh, be more competitive. We have been adding uh, revenues, not only because of the sales tax, but uh, as you point out, it's a big part. We have been more able to uh, add uh, or be more efficient uh, uh, collecting from those uh, members of the uh, private sector that are now paying uh, a little bit more. Uh, they, they, uh, the treasury, local treasury, have been more efficient going out after them. Uh, but we need to compete more. We have been, we have been uh, showing a little bit of success in tourism, for example. The tourism industry in Puerto Rico is the first that woke out of a recession already. Uh, it will be followed closely by agriculture if we have PROMESA and we are able to keep the government running. Uh, and manufacturing is, good, is giving good signs. But again, this is very, um, have been request a lot of effort and a, and a huge and, uh, and very um, rudimentary uh, procedures. Uh, I have been myself traveling to visit uh, companies to convince them to establish or to expand in Puerto Rico. So it, it's, it's not working as it's supposed to be because we lost uh, uh, our uh, competitive tools. Uh, let, let me point this uh, with, uh, out with, with an example. I, I, without the bill, fixed Puerto Rico economy will be like, 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 like build a, a Eiffel Tower with a screwdriver. It's, it's, you, need, you need tools. Uh, you need uh, uh, caterpillars or New Hollands or Ford or whatever. Uh, so that, that promise I give, give to us, the chance, the runway to do the other things. Some example that, that uh, the congressman uh, pointed out uh, earlier, Medicare. We receive less, but we pay the same. So, so it makes no sense for Congress to deny that to Puerto Rico. And that would add a lot of money to our health care system. We pay the same but we receive less. So if you are a Medicare recipient and you pay the same but receive less in Puerto Rico, but you, if you uh, move to Florida, you will pay the same and receive more. What would you do? So it's sim as simple as that. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed so our economy can grow uh, and our tax base can grow. Uh, PROMESA helps, but it's not, it's not, it's not enough. Other questions? <clears throat> Sorry, in the back. Uh, the, the guy? Paul Gallagher, uh, EIR News Service. On the question of um, whether there's a plan B, uh, or the Greek, uh, the creditors of Greece all last year used to say there is no alternative. So on that question, Puerto Rico lies directly on the Mona Passage from the Straits of Gibraltar to the uh, Panama Canal. It, uh, Ponce is potentially uh, a major hub of uh, Atlantic uh, cargo, particularly container trade. Puerto Rico has no railroad uh, mileage whatsoever. Uh, it has ancient power plants which uh, need to be replaced with uh, modern power facilities. A development bank, which 
uh, converts the debt of Puerto Rico to longer term, lower interest debt with a treasury guarantee and uses that restructuring to make investments in actually building up the uh, inf a, a new infrastructure for the island is an alternative. Puerto Rico was paying, uh, as far as I know, $4 billion a year. Uh, do you have a question? $4 billion a year in <coughs> debt service. Half of that could be leveraged to support such a development bank for the long-term investments. Why uh, are you uh, having opposed the bill before, now calling for only the, the passage of this bill, when there clearly any development economist could make six different designs for such a development bank and restructuring of the debt in, in 24 hours. Why <laughs> is this not being considered as the alternative? Could, well, could, could I just, as a practical matter, there are 18 different issuers of debt in Puerto Rico who have competing claims, who are already making competing, filing competing lawsuits. There are 14 different lawsuits in different jurisdictions already. There is no mechanism to bind holdouts. There is no mechanism to force agreement with any single class of creditor. We know what happens without an orderly restructuring mechanism in similar cases. Simply by looking around the world, what we're doing here is putting an orderly mechanism in place to restructure the debt such that there's certainty and there can be inbound investment from, as a result of the governor's trips around the world to encourage investment. Today, no one will invest in Puerto Rico until this crisis is resolved. Okay, <clears throat> one more question. Yes, <clears throat> to Mr. Wise, is as part of the restructuring process, the government of Puerto Rico, let's say, will not be paying the principal of the debt for five years. You know, that's a real possibility. Uh, can you include any of those years as a balanced budget? The test for exiting the uh, oversight, if that's your question, Jose, are number one, there have to have been four years of balanced budgets under generally accepted accounting principles. And number two, there has to have been access to municipal bond markets short and long term. And the Commonwealth hasn't had that access for really two and a half years. And so those are the two gating mechanisms to get, uh, to get the Commonwealth back on its feet. Uh, those, are the, those are the indications which will result in the dissolution of the Oversight Board. And as I said earlier, unlike the board in New York City, which was put in place in 1975 and is still in place today, unlike the Washington DC board, which can spring back in the event that targets aren't met, this is meant to come in, do its job, do its job once, and then disappear. Okay, well, we've, we've come to the end of uh, the time allotted for our discussion. I wanna thank this distinguished panel for a, a really great discussion of very important issues. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.